Hey everyone, in the next three videos I'm going to focus on these three gas laws in physics. These gas laws are of interest to a number of people in a number of different occupations, including aviation, which includes hot air ballooning for example, welding, pipe fitting, diving, and a number of occupations that involve either transferring or transporting compressed gases in cylinders or enclosures whether it's being transported by air, by land, or by sea. So, the video's layout is going to be fairly straightforward. I'm going to start with a plain language explanation of what the law means. It's going to be followed by a technical explanation. Connecting the two will be emphasized. And then it's going to be followed by a mathematical representation of the plain and the technical language variants. The mathematical representations can have many uh, written variants, and I'm going to explain those variants, how it could appear in the textbooks. And I'm going to connect the form of uh, mathematical representation to the plain language or the technical language variant. After this, there's going to be two sample calculations, one using metric units of measure and another one using imperial units of measure. So the first law, let's get started, is Charles' law. In English, this is pronounced Charles. It looks like Charles, but this is a Frenchman, Jacques Charles, is what, whom we are talking about. So this could be Charles' law, but that's pushing it. So either which way, Charles' law comes to us from the world of hot air ballooning. They were experimenting with balloons, and they found and observed the following things. In a balloon, with an open flame, when the gas inside is being heated up, the balloon expands sideways. And when an open flame, I'm not going to bring in here a cigarette lighter or an open flame, okay? When an open flame is turned off, the size of the balloon shrinks back to its original size. Very straightforward, yes? So how it looks like in technical language, and this applies to ideal gases, meaning that there are ideally or in an ideal condition, so ideal gases don't exist, but imagine there are no dirt particles in, inside this hot, hot air balloon, no pollen, no impurities of any kind, and the chemical composition of the gas is identical when you're comparing one balloon to another balloon. Just go with it. Ideal gases. And this works at a constant pressure, so this can be at sea level, or at whatever altitude, atop a mountain, at any pressure, but it's constant, meaning balloon 1 and balloon 2 will have the same identical pressure for comparison between the two of them, so you're comparing apples to apples. This gas can be enclosed in a rigid walled cylinder, that's fine, but the it should be enclosed in a way that the pressure doesn't change, so the tank must be expandable somehow. Just go with it. So, uh, that's what's meant by constant pressure. So, what, the, what Charles' law says in technical version is that temperature and volume are directly proportionate to each other. That's how this expanding balloon is captured in technical language. Notice, and this is important, that it starts with the word temperature and then the word volume is mentioned second. It doesn't work necessarily the other way. I'm going to explain this. So, an increase in temperature with the open flame will swell up the balloon or enlarge the balloon, so increase the volume. And a decrease in temperature when the open flame is turned off will result in a decrease in volume. That's what V is the last letter there. Let me just reposition you a little bit there. So V stands for volume consistently throughout the video and T will stand for temperature from here on. V and T will be used in the mathematical representation of this technical language variant. Okay. Notice it doesn't work the other way around. So, an increase in, if you switch around the V and the T, it's not going to work that way. I think if you increase the volume, such as whatever, if you increase the volume, it will increase the temperature. Not, that's not going to happen. Alright, that's not how it works. It works only this way. 
when temperature is the variable input and volume is the resultant consequence. Okay, it only works one way, this way. I hope that makes sense. So, let's take a look at some of these math versions. In your textbook, this uh, technical language can be stated in, for example, these three way ways. You can see T1, V1, T2, and V2 in these things as fractions, two equivalent fractions. That's what you're looking at here. Two equivalent fractions, just the letters are arranged a little differently. And this one here is a multiplication. So, the question arises obviously, how are these three all the same? Brilliant question. I'm glad you brought it up. So let me explain. Before I explain, okay, the explanation starts here. This is not just three variants, there's more to it. If I may say so, the V1 and V2 here can come over to the left side and this left side fraction can go over to the right side, that's what you see here. And likewise, T1 and T2 in the numerator can become here the denominator and it will still work. I'll show you how. And likewise, because there's a multiplication variant here, one number multiplied by the other is the same as one number, whatever, you can change those up. So that's what you see here. They are mirror opposites of each other this way. So the letters are flipped this way as well as they flipped from, from left to right. All right. So back to how are all of these variants the same? Well, let me pick easy numbers. A single digit number for T1, a single digit number for T2, a single digit number for V1, and a single digit number for V2. And this T1, T2, V1, V2 mean that I don't have two hot air balloons here, but just imagine two of them. So, hot air balloon, temperature 1 before heating, and volume 1 before heating. And then a little later on, Ideal gases, no contamination, same pressure. Temperature 2 after heating and volume 2 after heating of the same balloon or it could be two identical balloons side by side also with identical gases. So, if I choose single digit numbers for any of these and I just pick the first three that you saw say let, let's call T1 3 just just three, it doesn't matter if it's three degrees Celsius or three, just whatever, just three. T2 will be four, so the temperature goes up by one. Starts at three, goes up to four. And volume, the first volume is six. It doesn't matter if it's cubic feet, cubic meters, whatever, don't worry about it, it's just six. So it starts at six and it goes up to eight. So let's look at it as equivalent fractions. The equivalent fraction, yeah, let's start in the middle, why not? The equivalent fraction 3 over 6 is the same as the equivalent fraction 4 over 8. The fraction 4 over 8 and 3 over 6, they both can reduce to lowest terms 1 over 2. So these are equivalent fractions. That makes sense? Now, if you reshuffle the digits, this works this way as well. 3 over 4 is an equivalent fraction of 6 over 8. This pair of fractions is not the same as these pair of fractions, don't worry about that. I'm saying the number, the letters or numbers can be reshuffled. So 3 over 4 is the 6 as 3 over, 6 over 8. 3 over 4 is in its lowest terms, and so 3 quarters is the same as 6 eighths because you just double the numerator, double the denominator, whatever, equivalent fractions. And if you play with the letters along, T1 being 3 and whatever, the rest of the letters have the same numerical value, 3 times 8, 24, is the same as 4 times 6, also 24. And it doesn't matter which configuration you want to play with, you will find that these will all work with the 3, the 4, the 6, and the 8 in all of these configurations. Now, let's look at some math calculations. It does matter where the 1's or the 2's are written. In an equivalent fraction arrangement, the 1's must be on the same line horizontally, or the 1's must be lining up vertically. 
if they are on diagonals of each other, it's not going to work, ever. But in the multiplicative form, the 1 and the 2 index numbers, they must be side by side. If they are in any other arrangement, if, if the 1 and the 1 are side by side, T1 with V1, it's not going to work, ever. So if I toggle back, here you can see that 1s and 2s are side by side here, consistently. And here, 1s and 2s line up vertically here, consistently. And here, 1s and 2s line up horizontally, consistently. So that's where the magic happens. Okay, let's look at a calculation sample here. And let's use this format, why not? If temperature starts at, and this is an imperial units example, if the temperature starts at 32 degrees Fahrenheit and goes up to 572 degrees, just some whole number examples, why not? And the initial volume at cold or at the start, not necessarily at cold, is 47 cubic feet, what's going to be the resultant volume of the gas that's heated up? Do notice the input here is heat increasing. So what you do with it is replace the replace these four letters with the numbers given like so into equivalent fractions and then to solve it you cross multiply and divide by the third number. Cross multiply wherever these numbers end up. So cross multiply the 47 with the 52 in any order you like. There's only two choices there and divide it by the third number. You, when you enter it in the calculator, you are going to see that number 840 something something. So, on your answer line, this is how it looks like, 840.125. You can round it to 840 or whatever the job, uh, job requirements or criteria is. Don't forget your unit of measure, cubic feet. So that's how the imperial version or variant looks like. Let's look at a metric version where uh, the volume is given and the temperature is to be calculated. So, V1 is 23 cubic meters. That's your cold or starter volume. And its volume goes down to 17. So you start big, 23, and it goes down to 17 cubic meters. T1 is 81 degrees that belongs to this V1. So what's going to be V2? What's going uh, to be T2? What's going to be the temperature that corresponds to this lesser, lesser volume? Okay. So you start with a bigger volume. It's important to visualize it. You start with a bigger volume that has a temperature of 81. When the volume goes down, it's expected that you're going to have a temperature that's lower than what you started with because you're going to have a lesser volume. Okay? I hope that logic makes sense. Same procedure, pick one of the equations that you like, just one that works best for your brain, pick one, and then replace the letters with the given numbers. Out of the three numbers, two of them will be on a diagonal, and you can multiply those together and divide by the third number. When you enter it into a calculator, this is what you'll see, 59.8. Sorry, yeah, at 59.8, don't forget your unit of measure degrees Celsius. So, I hope this makes sense, that we started with a big volume at a higher temperature, and the volume went down, and we ended up with a temperature that's lower than what we had in the beginning. So 59.8 is less than 81. So that's how Charles' law works. That's what it means. In, its, in all of its technicality and it comes from hot air ballooning and this is how to make sense out of it and this is how to make sense out of the math which looks quite uh, complicated but actually once you get used to it it's fairly straightforward. Thanks for watching!